All right. Um, first, I'd like to welcome everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, Evgeny, last night you sent me a completely different set of questions. <laughs> that was a treat. I'm okay. sorry. Okay, okay, I'll have to improvise because I was preparing for something easier. Uh, okay, uh, question number one. What are you looking for in a candidate? Well, uh, I'm, I'm always looking for um, a number of things. Mm -hmm. One is technical competence for a role. Mm -hmm. And of course, it depends on the role. Um, we have a, a number of op open positions and I've been hiring for a while for a different, um, different set of companies. Uh, so technical competency is important. Mm -hmm. What I think is more important is uh, natural curiosity and potential. So if you have uh, an ability to learn and if you're interested in this area, uh, interested in learning and contributing, I think that's a really good indicator for me. And uh, of course, some positions require experience and some don't, uh, but I'm fairly flexible on that with some exceptions, of course. Uh, yeah. If I'm looking for a lead automation engineer with 10 years of experience and you only have one, uh, you probably don't have a chance. But if you have uh, maybe a few years of experience, it's not so much about the, the number of years you've been in this industry, it's about your knowledge, your ability to think critically, your ability to problem solve, solve and become in stressful situations. I would say these are the things that are most important. Interesting. Yeah, um, totally makes sense. What about uh, what's your favorite interview question? Do you have something in your mind? Uh, I do. Write it down, guys. Uh, especially those who want to apply for our positions yeah. uh, because that's my favorite question that doesn't mean you'll see it anywhere else I my favorite question is what is the biggest technical challenge you've ever faced and how you solved it uh, you see it's an open-ended question and it kind of forces you to describe the situation mm -hmm. forces you to describe your thinking process your approach mm -hmm. and I usually follow up with additional questions. So right. for example, if you tell me that your most difficult thing was this uh, evasive phantom bug that you, you could not reproduce all the time, I would probably start asking you more and more detail. So I'm a big fan of uh, situational interviewing. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you a situation. It, I will start with something very simple and then I will expand it. And uh, yeah, I'd say, I have to say that's my favorite question. Yes. Nice. How about uh, like no go? What's your red flag when you do interview? Like, who, like imagine the guy he, he passed phone screening. He showed up on interview. You start asking him questions. Everything goes wrong. But something is something is wrong. What could be that in in your mind? <laughs> okay, uh, there is a few things. Uh -huh. One is please don't lie. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll catch you. Uh, I've been doing this for a while, and let me tell you a story. Uh, uh, how many of you worked with Java? Okay, quite a few. Do you know when Java became publicly available? I don't know. Anybody knows? 1998. Mm -hmm. uh, the development began a little bit before that. So in 2001, I was interviewing a person who claimed to have five years of experience. Oh. <laughs> Right. So unless he worked at Sun, where <laughs> this was known as Project Oak, and it was started in 1995, he didn't have Sun on his resume. So that's number one red flag. Number two, uh, don't try to invent things. It's much, much better to say, I don't know, mm -hmm. to a question, than trying to come up with some BS. Uh, it, it's, it's obvious, okay? <laughs> Uh, that's number two. Number three is uh, that doesn't apply to all positions, okay? Uh, the first two are across the board. If, mm -hmm. if, if I see something like that, I will not hire a candidate. Number three is really about uh, lead positions, manager positions, mm -hmm. essentially positions that require communication skills. And uh, if a candidate avoids eye contact during an interview, uh, that's a red flag to me. So when you talk to people who are hiring you, 
look them, look at their eyes, look at, look them at their eyes. <laughs> Probably a good idea. Okay, cool. Uh, how about the resume tips? Any like, what's your when you what is the um, um, in resume which can be catching your eyes? Probably you looking into tons of resumes every day, right? Not every day, but once in a while. So uh, no, I don't. We we have an awesome people, okay. jobs department okay. HR. And they uh, filter the resumes for me. So, <laughs> but um, on a more serious note, you probably know that most resumes are go uh, are going are read by machines, mm -hmm. right? So when you create a resume, I think it's important for you to have a list of skills mm -hmm. that uh, will a list of skills and abilities that will catch well the eye, the eye of the machine, so to speak. Right. Um, after, when it gets to me, it usually is, the candidate usually meets all the qualifications or most of them. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it's impossible to meet all of them in some cases. What I am looking for really, what, can I name just one thing? Sure. The most important thing to me. Uh, it's your personal contribution. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I'm not a big fan of things such as uh, participated in regression testing. I don't know what that means. Okay. What was your role, right? Uh, so I am looking for things such as uh, what you personally did as individual or part of the team, how you helped the team, and how measurable that is. Uh, in addition to the skill set, of course. Yeah, that's, that's important. Uh, unless it's in an intern position. Cool, cool. Any question? Oh, we have a question. Uh, hi. Sure. Hi. Victoria, um, you said during the presentation that don't require experience. So my question is, what kind of experience do you need? Because it's not just about the second one. Your favorite question to people that don't have experience. Since you say um, you can ask the person what was your best problem and how did you solve that right. most interesting uh, problem. So yeah, I was wondering, let's say I'm without experience and you interviewing me. Yeah. What would be the question? Let me rephrase the question. So basically what to do for people who doesn't have um, working experience that much, right? Or like for new people who are getting into trying to get into their role. Yeah, that's, that's tough. Uh, let me try to answer the first part of the question. Uh, if you don't have experience, it's, I think your best bet is to find an entry level position or perhaps an intern position. A lot of companies have uh, internship programs. We here at Bluebeam have one as well. And uh, it's typically aimed for students sophomores or juniors or seniors but if you're done with your education and just don't have experience it's probably uh, something where you would want to start okay um, the second part of the question was what is my favorite <laughs> I, I don't interview interns very often right but uh, if i did i'd probably have to say uh, that um, i don't know i can't think of any particular question uh, I would want to make sure that you can uh, think out of the box. And I'm not a big fan of riddles or, you know, Google style, former Google style of interviews where, you know, how, how many golf balls fit an air, into an airplane. I think it's completely irrelevant. Uh, but I would probably try to uh, give you, if, if I can't ask you about the situation that you experienced, I would create one for you and see how you, how you would try to uh, resolve it. You're welcome. All right. Oh, we have another question. Can you speak up a little bit? Or come over here. Come over here. Okay, uh, the question was, if you're hiring somebody for uh, an automation role, how important is the uh, computer science degree? 
Uh, it used to be extremely important. Uh, I think it's less important. To me, it's completely irrelevant. Uh, what is your degree in music? No. <laughs> what is that? Thermal power engineering. Okay, as long as you know your stuff, I don't care what, what degree you have. But that's me. Thank you. You're welcome. Go ahead. You mentioned that you don't let people BS if they don't know something. Right. But basically with any technology, you know lots of things, but there's many, many more that you don't know. Okay. So given that you don't know it, how important do you think it is that someone is able to sort of rationalize a solution versus just knowing that the answer is wrong. Okay. previously Okay, so the question was, um, let me rephrase, let me paraphrase that. The difference between BS and arriving to a solution, right? So not just BS, but like, just having known something previous, like basically experience. Having okay. experience and you just know the answer versus you didn't know the answer, but you're able to derive the same solution. Right, okay. Uh, let me, let me answer that by giving you an example. Uh, what's your favorite computer language, programming language? Okay. <laughs> so uh, if I ask you, have you ever done uh, app programming in Objective-C? And you say yes. And I'm gonna start asking you about specific details on how to do events and things like that. Uh, and you have no idea, that's lying, okay? On the other hand, if I ask you, I'll give you a situational question. I'll say, um, I don't know, we have a standard three-tier web system and you're responsible for testing it. What's your approach? And you don't know much about the system, but then you're, start, you're starting to come up with some sort of a solution. And more importantly, you're asking me questions, clarifying questions. To me, that's arriving to a solution. To me, that's a difference. And uh, in the first scenario, I won't hire you, no matter what. In the second, well, depends on depends on how you do. Does that answer your question? Yeah. All right. Awesome. Anybody else? No. Yes. Okay, so the question was, do you like to give your applicants a coding challenge, basically ask them to code? Uh, I do, but there is a caveat. So uh, we, here at Bluebeam, we use HackerRank. How, how many of you know about HackerRank or used it before? Uh, for those who don't, it's basically a site uh, or a community, I don't know how to describe it, that allows you to create a bunch of questions or a bunch of problems that require applicants to code a solution. Uh, sounds good, right? The problem is they could ask their neighbor to do it. So I've seen it. I've seen uh, fairly recently there was a candidate who completely nailed the hacker rank test. I mean, uh, on our scoring system, it was probably 40 out of 40. And then during an in-person interview, um, well, uh, he didn't really know what the variable was. So, uh, okay. I, I would like, the, the answer is I would love to use them, but I'm skeptical by nature. And uh, just based on experience, I think it's a, lot, it's a lot easier for me to ask a situational question and find out about the person's experience. Uh, I, you know, I, I really don't care if you remember the syntax for it. I mean, with modern IDs and tools, you can, they will fix things for you. So uh, I guess the answer is not very much. No, I'm not a big fan. Thank you. Please. No. Hi. Hi. I'm from Israel. Hey. Down. Uh, Shalom. My question is, <laughs> my question is uh, more generic. Okay. Know, we, we have a lot of debates in Israel about you know where the QA profession is going. Is it going to die? You know, is it going to be automated? I, I really would like to hear your take on this. How you see the future of QA, and would you recommend to you know testers and engineers you know to go to more to automation, to be more developers, or to stay with the functional explorers? Wow. 
Wow, that's that's a great question. The uh, the future of QA. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, listen, I before joining Bluebeam, uh, my entire career has been in Silicon Valley, and uh, sometimes you can see the trends there a little bit sooner than in other places. So uh, the need for testing is always going to be there, right? It's human nature, we make mistakes as human and humans, and we learn from those mistakes. Uh, there is different risk level, right? For, so uh, for a military program or uh, some sort of space program, the risk is very different, but the approach is the same. The question then is, uh, is there a future for manual testing? And in my opinion, the answer is no, not very much. With the advance of AI and machine learning, no, it's gonna die. Now, uh, what's the future for automation? I think automation is still going to be there, but I see more and more companies going to this uh, model of embedded QA which where QA or QE engineers uh, are part of a team and it's kind of a durable autonomous team. And uh, I personally prefer somewhat of a hybrid model where there's a central QA function that is responsible for tools and, and standardization and performance testing, basically all the horizontal functions. So uh, if you wanna stay in this, in this uh, industry, I think, uh, Automation is the key. It's not the perfect solution, but in my opinion, that will stay for, for quite some time. But manual testing, yeah, that's gonna go away. Not entirely, but there's always place for manual testers. But I think uh, a lot more and more organizations will try to hire automation engineers who can do automation and manual testing if necessary rather than having two separate teams because then you can't really scale. In how many years do you think you can do this? In how many years, do you, how many years it's gonna go away? I just wanna know, should I go or should I not? Uh, I don't should I go or should I stay? Should I go or should I stay? <laughs> I think uh, um, you wanna be a manual tester? You want to be director of QA? <laughs> come, come on, try it. You want to try it for a day? <laughs> uh, I, 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 I honestly don't know. Uh, I think a lot, many organizations are moving towards that. Uh, I can tell you that uh, here in, at Bluebeam, we are in the middle of transition from uh, QA to QE. I know it's one letter and it, and it seems like semantics, it doesn't really matter, but I want to make a point that, uh, you know, quality is engineering. And that's why one of the things that I really hate is when people say uh, engineers and quality, as if they, as if to imply that QAs are not engineers. They are, they're just different types of engineers. So I have no idea. I think a few years, uh, I don't know, maybe 10, but, uh, but even if it doesn't go away completely, I think it's going to be, uh, it's going to be harder to find jobs, but I mean, that's my opinion. I may be wrong. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank I you. think that was very, 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 very,